And recording has started, Your Worship. Thank you. We'll call <clears throat> the meeting of the uh, Trend Hills Council to order at 9.31 a.m. Um, and this council meeting is being held by electronic participation pers pursuant to... Sorry, Your Worship, that's me. What happened? That was me. Oh, okay. Um, this council meeting is being held by electronic participation pursuant to the municipality's procedural bylaw number 2020-020 as amended in section 238 uh, part 3.1 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended. The meeting will be live streamed on the municipality's uh, meeting portal and YouTube channel. Uh, the video recording will be uploaded to the Municipality of Trent Hills website following the meeting. And uh, I would now go to adoption of the agenda. Could I get a mover and seconder, please? Be, the res <coughs> be, it, <coughs> excuse me, be it resolved that the agenda for the council meeting of February, <coughs> excuse me, February 16th, 2021, be received and adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Moved by Kathy, seconded by Mike. Um, Doug, will you call the question, please? Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, any disclosure of pecuniary interest? <clears throat> and as we begin, I, I, uh, I, I will let uh, everyone that's um, joining us know that uh, all of council is here. We have uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Mike Metcalf, Councillor Rick English, Councillor Kathleen Redden, Councillor Ken Tully, Councillor Jean Brahini, and Councillor Rosemary Kelleher McLennan. Um, I'm doing that because, as uh, because I'm so familiar with uh, my council, I usually call them by their first names, and I just want everybody to know who's here. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, the minutes of the council meeting held uh, January the nineteenth, twenty twenty one, and the special council meeting held on February the fourth, twenty twenty one, be it resolved that the minutes of the council meeting held on January the nineteenth, twenty twenty one and the special council meeting held on February the 4th, 2021, be received and adopted as presented or amended. Um, can I get a mover and seconder, please? Moved by Rick. I move. Seconded by Rose. <coughs> um, Doug, will you call a question, please? Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Craig? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have the minutes of the public uh, hearing public meetings held on February the 9th, 2021. Be resolved that the minutes of the public uh, hearings, the public meetings held on February the 9th, 2021, be re received. <clears throat> Can I get a mover and seconder, please? I'll move. Moved by Ken. I'll second. Second by Jean. Uh, would you call the vote, please, Doug? Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, we have no public hearings or public meetings. Uh, deputations, <clears throat> we are joined today by uh, Dan Borwick, <clears throat> Director of Economic Development Planning and Strategic In Initiatives from the County of Northumberland, and Jennifer Cook, uh, H2O Getaways. Um, Dan? Thank you. thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, um, to, to, to speak to Council regarding uh, uh, H2, H2O getaways, which uh, our department has been uh, ac actively engaged with for, for quite some time. Um, it's, uh, we've done a fair amount of work through our Business and Entrepreneurship Centre and, and, um, 
in, in, in part, this is uh, the timing on this is, is, is exceptionally good in that as the, the county uh, begins to, to uh, un undertake a, a review of its, it, its tourism function, moving maybe more away from tourism marketing and directing it more towards tourism product development, uh, this type of uh, activity that uh, uh, H H2O getaways can, can bring to, uh, to Trent Hills, especially in conjunction with the federal investment for the, uh, the, the refurbish and revamp and, and creation of, of uh, additional uh, docking facilities um, comes at, it, it, it's very, very timely. And uh, it, it, it would be my pleasure to just introduce uh, Jennifer Cook, who is one half of uh, H2O getaways along with John Lott. And uh, there is a slide presentation, um, and um, maybe I can turn it over to to, to Jen to talk to uh, talk about who she is and uh, some some or who they are and what the project summary looks like. So next slide, please. And Jennifer, over to you. Thank you so much. Dan. Um, so as Dan mentioned, that we, my husband and I, have created H Two O Getaways, which is an upscale boutique houseboat rental company which is actually the first of its kind on the, to operate on the lower half of the Trent Severn waterway. And just a little background on John and I, we are a husband and wife entrepreneurial team and we've worked on a number of projects such as from uh, theater productions to a sound rental company to renovating houses and most recently running a uh, custom boat canvas shop uh, out of Crate Marine, which we sold in 2019. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, uh, so John and I have mused <laughs> over the years many, uh, many times about starting a houseboat rental company and never had the time. Thanks to COVID, we now had lots of time and we could see an opportunity to create an um, experience for people to have a safe uh, adventure, to enjoy the water, to uh, enjoy some history and nature while also becoming aware of all the fabulous things that are in our surrounding area and in our community. So we've created H2O as a way to combine our love of boating, our love of the Trent Severn waterway, as well as creating and supporting our community, um, creating jobs, especially for young people. We want them to be able to learn and grow alongside us with the company, and also to be able to partner with businesses, creating a lot of uh, the opportunities for the tourism dollars to stay within the community. And I'm just gonna let Dan talk a little bit more about that. Just, from, just, just to maybe summarize the information on the, on the chart, the an, an anticipated revenues for H, H2O getaways in, in terms of year one is approximately um, uh, $273,000, uh, 200, actually 267,600 in, 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 in total. Um, part of the part of the work that we've done in terms of some of the research being provided is that type of uh, visitor spend as a result of H2O getaways really has a significant revenue impact on on the community as a whole. And the projections would indicate that with that type of spend, there'd be about another six hundred and twenty one thousand dollars that would come into Hastings over the course of their 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 season. Um, next slide, please. So when we were doing uh, the majority of our research in, into other houseboat companies, we found that most of those houseboat companies were rented uh, fully booked by the end of February. So as you can see from the chart with Happy Days Houseboats, as an example, we have a, a strong confidence in building a thriving business in Hastings. Um, next slide, please. So uh, timelines, we're encouraging with the anticipated <laughs> anticipated um, uh, excitement about the company, we uh, are planning on having encouraging weekly rentals for the boats so that the season will run from June 7th to October 11th. And what that means for the community is that our boats will ideally only be at the docks from Friday early afternoon to Saturday afternoon, giving us an opportunity to turn the boats over, get people on and off, and then they'll be on their way again. Um, so as you can see, the details uh, of the number of boats, we'll have four boats and all of the safety features. So if I can have the next slide, please. 
Um, as you know already, John and I are the creators and owners of H2O Getaways, but we're also going to be the operators throughout the season, which is, encourages confidence for us, especially to uh, create an experience that we have uh, designed and have envisioned. And as you can see from the presentation, we've made a sizable financial investment in the company, as well as our time and not to say the least of our uh, blood, sweat and tears as we design, uh, redesign and <coughs> boats with our own hands. Um, and if we have, I think we can move on to the next slide. We're gonna be one of the great things. So this vision for us is that we will create a safe, attractive, well-run houseboat rental company, which serves not only us and the community, but also our customers. And as well as doing that, we wanna create opportunities for everyone to work together in partnerships. And, and uh, together. Is that your role to us? So is that, sure, yeah. can I keep going? Yes. Okay, um, so we're creating a provisioning package for boaters um, using local goods and services that we can, uh, present to the boat. We're also going to have them create a, a fresh goods basket to be delivered. We're working with uh, um, the restaurants. We want to work with the restaurants and B&Bs in the area help, so that we can encourage people to come a day earlier or stay a couple days later and spend their tourism dollars in the community. Um, so what else did I want to tell you? Oh, yes. And so we're also working with Hastings Marine. They're doing all of They're providing all of our outboard motors. So we're we're happy to ex expand all of our uh, partnerships in the, in the surrounding areas. Our website will be up and running and people will be able to uh, book online, make their deposits. And we've already, as we started our uh, coming soon campaign, we've already had people inquiring about how to go about booking. So that bodes well for all of us. And if I could have the next slide, please. So these, the next two slides are the requirements that we, uh, we would need to be productive, most productive and most successful in Hastings. And I have no doubt all of you have had a good look at it. <laughs> um, and the last slide, we can go back to that. I thought I'd give you an opportunity to ask questions at the end. So if we go to the next slide, um, shows our parking situation we need to talk about. And then the last slide is a picture of our boat. Uh, one of the boats. So we're going to have four boats that will be docked at the, the, the marinas at Friday to Saturday. <laughs> but we have two 37 Gibson uh, sports and two 40 foot blue water yachts. They're houseboat style cruisers. Um, so the best of both worlds um, between a houseboat and a cruiser. So uh, if I can answer any questions or if I've missed out on anything. Um, okay, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, anyone have any questions as we uh, go along? Kathy, and then Mike? Yeah, um, first of all, I think it's a really great idea. And I guess I'm a little bit surprised that we never had any in the in the lower half of the of the waterway. Although, um, I think in the past, some of, as you may already know, some of the um, PR around houseboats hasn't always been the best. And um, a, a number of years ago, when I served on the Waterway Advisory Committee, uh, one of the individuals there actually was a houseboat owner from the, from the upper part. Um, and I think the, the biggest issue is, is people that have never sailed, never, never boated, never done whatever, they never been on the water, um, getting on a houseboat and thinking it's easy to manage. And I see you're doing some training and, and, and the training particularly um, it is great. How much training are you giving them on going through the locks, which is pretty much one of the toughest parts when they're trying to go through, they're being blown around and there are other boats in there. Yes, understood. And mm -hmm. I'm well aware I've had that experience. Both John and I have rented a number of houseboats over the years, even though we have our own powerboat. So, uh, and because we are quite familiar with all of the lock masters, 
we also do not want to uh, make ourselves, <laughs> yeah. we want to still separate ourselves from the rest of the houseboat reputation. So part of the thing, one of the things that we've done is uh, include a bow and stern thruster on all of the boats. So that allows you to move side to side. So it gives you just an extra bit of uh, control when you're locking. Also, all of our boats have side um, walk arounds. So I know when I, if I can't catch the, the rope on the way in, you can walk down and you can catch it again. So you have a lot of opportunities there. The boats also don't go very fast. They're going 10 knots. So you have, the, the slower you go, the safer you are. So that, mm -hmm. that's in turn going into the locks. So we ourselves, because we have experience on a number of, uh, in that area, we will be taking great care in exp explaining to them. We're getting them to have their boat operator's card as well and to watch videos of going in and out of the locks. So we, it's our reputation on the line, which we take quite seriously. Um, so we will make sure we'll do everything we can to make it as easy as possible for them to get in and out of the locks. Just to follow up on that, if I may, um, I, I think you're, you're right picking the lower part because it has got some of the most beautiful scenery in it. Um, will they be accessing Rice Lake at all or will you just keep them in from Hastings South? Uh, no, they can access, we can, we technically are able to go up to lock 20. Oh, okay. Before the Kawarthas. So that okay. becomes our whole, um, and partly the, one of the wonderful things about being in Hastings would allow us if chance the water's high and the locks don't open at the beginning of the season we still could rent the boats and they could uh still take trips right. up ice lake so perfect. that is a bonus for all of us okay perfect thank you you're welcome uh michael <clears throat> thank you your worship uh you'll have to indulge me this is going to sound a bit like a job interview that's all right um, my first question uh, on your first slide is, says that you are offering locally manufactured um, and retrofit high-end quality accommodations. Where is the manufacturing facility locally? Well, we'll be using uh, Bellevue in Bellevue Fabrication. They've done work already on our boat. Uh, we have a, for a 50 foot pacemaker at Crates and they've done a lot of work on our boat. So we have uh, an engineer, a naval architect engineer doing drawings for the swim platforms and for the to hold the outboard motors on the back. We'll also hire uh, local carpenters to help us with the interior of the boat. And sorry, you'll have to indulge. Where's Bellevue Fabrication located? Sorry, that's in, it's in Bell, it's in actually in Belleville. In Belleville, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, you speak of encouraging tourism revenue and a positive impact on direct and indirect workforce development. Can you pro provide us some examples of what uh, you would consider a tourism res revenue and those direct and indirect workforce developments? Um, well, a number of things. I feel like also, um, so starting with the fuel, we're using, we'll be using all the local uh, gas stations to fill up the boats, well, or the tanks for the boats. We're buying our uh, outboard motors, all of the outboard motors, which are two of them, 230 horsepower outboards to be on each of the boats, plus um, a backup for each of those. So we're buying those at Hastings Marine. They'll also be our maintenance crew. Um, we're, we're hiring young people. We have, we're creating four part-time jobs throughout the season. Um, and also the, the provisioning packages allows us to work with a number of uh, either farms or the markets or small businesses in terms of meats like, or sterling and the sterling, sterling butter. We have a lot of the paradise tarts. So we have a lot of things like that, that people can, if they wanna come and they want us to do the shopping, we can do all of that and we'll pr provide them a list of the things um, in that regard. And also then sending them to the restaurants and partnering with the B&Bs if they wanna stay overnight. Okay, Is that thank you. your question? Uh, yeah, um, and if you'll indulge me, Your Worship, I have a, a couple more. You spoke about uh, meat packages and local business and that sort of thing. Uh, on your slide, uh, the one, two, the eight businesses that you have addressed there are all in Hastings County. So 
they're not in Hastings, they're not in Trent Hills, and they're not in Northumberland County. So I'm not sure if you've reached the mark on when you say you want to provide from local farms, small businesses, and shops within downtown Hastings. So that's probably something you're going to want to look at because most of those businesses are between 40 and 60 kilometers away from Hastings. Um. My mistake then. Uh, I was under the impression that uh, the meat market, the Hastings meat market was actually in Hastings. That's their address. Um, and so I was assuming that all of the things were around the, the area, not just in Hastings, but uh, in the county around <clears throat> it. I thought it supported all of them. I'm, I ha we haven't set up the actual partnership, so I'm open to possibilities. And by all means, I am happy to partner with anyone in Hastings as we move forward. That was my intention, obviously. <laughs> I, your Worship, I'll let uh, see if anyone else has anything else at this time. Okay, Rose. Mike uh, actually touched on my uh, my question. My concern was um, I'm looking at where the products are coming from, and I see a lot of stuff there, like Ivanhoe and Sterling. And we have a cheese factory within our municipality, uh, the Empire, as well as a number of other things that Mike uh, Mike touched on. So that was that was my concern and question, Your Worship. Thank Absolutely. you. And I'm more than happy to adjust those uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay. Um, I, I have a just a couple of uh, things to to ask about. Um, the, the people that are going to be dri driving these boats, will they have a boater's license? Yes, we are asking, we're requiring them to have a boater's license before they arrive. Okay. Um, the, um, and, and I guess one of the concerns we, we have is um, um, water and hydro. Um, here's, um, <clears throat> Neither are neither one of them right now uh, at that uh, at the location. Uh, hydro is not too far away, but um, but there is no water there. Um, so those those are concerns that we have to to address. Um, yes. Can I can can I address the water initially? Yeah. Um, just that we only we're only requiring forty to fifty gallons, and we can get that as potable water. So it doesn't have to be an ongoing source at the dock. We can we can transfer it from somewhere else to the boats. Oh, okay. Okay, and then and, and hydro. I guess um, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's not there, and we'd have to we'd have to figure that out. Yes. Uh, we, we don't know a cost. That's, I mean, that's part of the problem we have is we, we don't have a cost on what it would, would take to uh, put that there. Uh, other than that, I mean, <clears throat> I, I, um, I'm feeling somewhat better about my concern. Uh, my, my concern, and I, I, I voiced it through Dan in the past, but I, I just to bring it up is um, I, I, originally there, there was talk of five boats and five boats five boats would take up that whole dock. And I, I, I was concerned that, um, you know, our residents um, would, would not have use of, of the dock. Uh, and and, and if, if the boats aren't rented, then, then they are taking up that space uh, on a full-time basis. But I guess, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> that's to be seen. Hopefully, listen, I... I, <laughs> I, 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 I I've lived with all this and I, I, listen, I had a... I had a 32 foot pontoon houseboat and, and I know how nervous the, the uh, uh, operators of those uh, locks are when they see you coming. Um, you know, I, I had the experience of, of it, was like, it was almost like a biblical thing. You know, you'd come up behind a whole bunch of really super duper boats in this. Uh, <laughs> and and all, it was like the parting of the waters. They Nobody wanted to be the first one in the lock. They wanted you to go first. So I, I, yeah. I've had that experience. Um, uh, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's something that, um, that we can definitely work at and, but we do need to find out some numbers as far as hydro and, and that sort of thing goes. Mike, did you have anything else? Yeah. I, I, another comment, something that, um, I mean, it was back in 2019, August 22nd, we stood on the dock 
or at the marina there and, and with the announcement of 340,000. And uh, I'll be completely honest, it was somewhat of a shock to me because uh, at the time, the discussions with uh, any discussions with Lebo had pretty much failed at that time and they were more or less out of the question. So uh, right from the very beginning that that discussion was uh, or the announcement was was somewhat of of a shock since then uh you know we we reworked it that that uh, federal money did come and and was was to be used and and the majority of that money was put towards uh fixing and revamping our boat launch which was um, one of the the biggest project that we needed to get done at that marina to be able to service the boats uh and the community in with that money since that time, the municipality ourselves, on top of that 340,000, has put in 120,000 of public taxation dollars in order to finish those docks on the north side, in order to complete what we need to do on the south side as well. So there's quite, this isn't just federal money that's floating around, this, there's quite a bit of an investment on our end as well. And the intent is to have those as, uh, as I'm concerned, transient docks to be able to encourage uh, travel through and people to come and go at, at leisure. Um, our marina that we have on the south side has a waiting list that's probably, uh, and staff could, could correct me if I'm wrong, at least two to three years long before we'll even get through it. And it continues to compile as to the number of people that would like to have seasonal rentals on our south side. So uh, the amount of transient docks that we are able to have at the marina are becoming limited uh, because of the necessity to to provide those seasonal amenities for for boaters that want to bring their boat and park and, and be there for a season. So it's a little bit challenging for me on that side with the investment that that we've taken from public taxation dollars and to provide a private entity with the funds that we've used in the intent of having that as a as a public entity. So that's just sort of where I stand. I, I mean, I, I like the, the, the business idea. There's quite a few questions that I'm still gonna have that we don't have time to, to be here all, all day about. I'm a, a business person on, on my end. So this is something I've been doing for 20, 25 years. And th there's a few things that, uh, like I said, that just, just need to be, need to definitely be tweaked, um, especially in the, in the local procurement uh, area and doing the research on what's available around Hastings Village. But. Yes, I agree. And I will just say on that regard, because we haven't been uh, secured a spot at Hastings, I am keeping, we were keeping our options open along the whole trend. So in the whole Northumberland area. So my, our idea is to encourage everyone. We want to be more, once we're in Hastings, we are more than happy to work together to make it viable and thriving for everyone included. But at the moment, and yes, you're right. <laughs> Perhaps I should have done it uh, directly for Hastings, but I've talked to the, those people in the surrounding area. So that's sort of partly where I was coming from in that regard. I know it's a big, uh, a, st a bit of a sticking point. So I wanted to just be clear on that before we left, but I'll leave it to Dan if he has something to say about the rest of it. Okay, um, <clears throat> just, uh, Kathy, a question? Um, just, just a comment and a question, and, and, and I guess I do know, and Dan knows some individuals that will be quite pleased to see you promoting the other Hastings, um, which is, is local and, and they do travel over this way, but there's always that confusion between the village of Hastings and the county of Hastings. Yes. Um, and um, this is the village. Um, question, in terms of the revenue, uh, the rental and so on, um, where will it be, where will it go? Just into a general pot? Will it go back into a specific upgrades? Where, where will the revenue from this be, be put? I don't know whether Peter can answer that or, or someone else or Lynn? Lynn? Um, well, at this point, we clearly no decisions were made on that, but there'd be a couple of options. I mean, it could be sort of rolled in with our marine operation, um, you know, to, and then any, where, where there's any proceeds there, if there is any sort of surplus that's sort of reinvested into the facility and into the docks. So here, like Councillor Metcalf mentioned, there has been some investment on behalf of the municipality. Hmm. We have drawn down some reserves, so there could be a plan to um, replace that, those funds. 
over the coming years with, with some of that revenue, or there could be some kind of community fund set up. There'd be lots of options um, to look at, but that would probably be our original suggestion is to sort of try and incorporate it within the um, marina operation and look at it as an improvement fund, really. And okay. maintenance, improvement and maintenance, right? For, for right. both docks, both facilities, yeah. Right, okay. And, and, and is this our first sort of private public uh, partnership that we've dealt with here? Have we had other requests? Um, I'm not sure if we've had other requests in the past. This is the first. I think we've um, have certainly gone to this to this um, length. Um, yeah, I can't think of another example. I mean, we have lots of private dockages, obviously, both in Campbellford and in Hastings. But this not not so in basing a business from one of our facilities. No. <coughs> Uh, Dan, did you have anything to add? Only, only that uh, uh, just maybe maybe next steps, uh, um, uh, maybe what we're trying to maybe establish here today is to, to seek council's a approval to to uh, have staff initiate the final, some final de details to create a, a, a user agreement. Um, okay. Um, that's right, so. Okay, well, I, I, you know, I think, um, you know, there are a few questions and, and uh, I guess what we need to do is, um, um, you know, get, get uh, you and uh, staff together and, and see if we can't work these out so council can, uh, can go forward with this. I, I mean, I, I think um, uh, it's an exciting um, venue and, uh, um, but, you know, again, being our first kick at the cat, um, uh, I think we should uh, make sure we cross uh, all the T's and dot the I's. Michael. Yeah, thank you, Worship. In all fairness, um, I mean, this is the, the, we're into almost the end of February, and this is the first time that this council has seen anything about this proposal, unless we've been privy to uh, speaking with senior management, which doesn't always happen on a, on a basis, especially during COVID. Um, I, I, and honestly, I think it's, it's very wishful that that uh, the next step is to, to go to um, a user agreement, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's tight lines to try to get, uh, to get this complete, seeing as this is the first time that this council has, uh, has seen the, the majority, uh, if any of this uh, proposal at all. So I, I'd be happy to see uh, what we come up with, but uh, again, I believe it's pretty <coughs> tight to, to get in line. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? So, Mayor uh, Bob? Yes, Dean. Uh, as you, most of you know, I've lived here quite a while and close to the water, but I've never been a, a boater, never been on the waterways. Uh, I guess my concern is with these operators, do they have any uh, boating experience to when they show up or are they just strictly novice that all of a sudden they got a card and just just like doing anything else is there any uh driving experience behind this or is it just go for it on a rookie basis uh, right. go ahead yeah oh thank you uh well there is a little bit of that because people aren't all boaters like you said um, we personally, as I mentioned, is, it is our reputation that we hold strongly to. So we are not about to let someone off the dock unless we feel that they are completely confident. And we are both experienced boaters, John and I have been for a long time and also have operated houseboats a number of times. So we will be quite, and we have um, created a scenario where to make it as easy as possible for everyone to feel confident because you can't relax and the community can't relax and we won't definitely relax if uh, we're worried about people running into someone else. So uh, we are taking that responsibility on for ourselves. Very good, thank I, you. I, I, uh, I agree when you say um, I, I, I do both. I'm not sure I would put myself in class with being a, a, I'm not an expert for sure, but I have learned over the years that the slower you go, the less chance you have of having something serious happen. And that's 
I, I, one question I did wonder, it, that, that boat you showed was obviously a boat that had a, a, an inboard motor on it at one time. Um, and, and so you're switching to outboards. Is, is, there, can, is there a specific reason why? Um, well, partly because it, they're easier to operate and maintain. So if one of, and we have two of them so that they're one easier to, um, if one cacks out, you always have a backup. So then you're always safe. You're not left without anything at all. Um, and we can replace them. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Oh, so and the other thing I wanted to add is that they were creating them so that they can only go 10 knots. So you cannot go any faster than that on the boat. So. Um, as you mentioned, yes. speed is important. That's definitely important. <laughs> okay. Um, then I will, uh, we do have a resolution. Be it resolved that the PowerPoint presentation presented by Dan Borowick, Director of Economic Development Planning Strategic Initiatives for the County of Northumberland and Jennifer Cook, H2O Getaways, read the H2O Getaways be received for information uh, and I would um, ask for a mover and seconder on that. So moved. Moved by uh, Ken, seconded by Mike. Um, and call a question, please, Doug. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Counts, uh, Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. And I, I guess I would add, uh, so I think it's that, uh, um, you know, we need staff and, and uh, um, Jennifer and, and Dan to, uh, to uh, get together and, and uh, just iron out these things so that council has the opportunity to uh, go forward. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you the time and the attention. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Look forward to uh, meeting with you again. Um, I would uh, we now go to reports from municipal officers. Uh, we, we have the uh, finance 2021-003, the uh, 2020 statement of council remuneration and expenses. Be it resolved that the report finance 2021-003 from Valerie Nesbitt, director of uh, finance treasurer read the 2020 statement of council remuneration and expenses be received for information. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please. Moved by Rick. Seconded by Mike. Uh, call the question, please, Doug. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Yeah, and my my error, did anyone have any questions on that report? I, I, I didn't ask if that was uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, next report is uh, uh, EDC 2021-03, read the digital Main Street digital footprint update. Be resolved that staff report EDC-2021-03 from Kiramis Community Development Officer read the digital Main Street and digital footprint update be received for information. A mover and seconder, please. Moved by Rose, seconded by Kathy. Any discussion? Kathy? Um, I understand the project was really successful with the majority of the participants. And I'm just curious, Kira, if there'll be any follow-up or maybe Rosemary can answer this as well from the meetings. Will there be any follow-up on how it really benefited them during their shutdowns with the businesses? Because I know I've, I've spoken to one business that was so grateful to be able to do things online and whether this, if you have to do follow-up or not, to uh, indicate how, how well it went, um, or if that's something maybe we should look at and then encourage the others that don't have a virtual presence to get on board. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's one thing that Jen's working on right now okay. is um, collecting the um, impact of the participation of the uh, grant applicants. And the BIA is currently undertaking a 
kind of a share your story exercise. So having people do some outreach and, you know, just reconnecting with the membership. So they're kind of coming at it from two ways. So, and we're, you know, we're hopeful that there might be more funds announced and the fact that these um, intakes have been so successful that there'll be even uh, a more, a timely intake of it. Cause it, it did take a, a little bit of a while for the word to get out about the program. Mm -hmm. um, so now that we've had these successes, both with the, um, the BIA version and the, um, so digital Main Street and digital footprint. I think um, any further intakes will be very, uh, you know, quickly <laughs> received and uh, applied for. Okay. I I just want to say for some of the naysayers, originally they're on board now. They see the value. It all came at the right time. Good. Great. Okay, anyone else? Michael. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I, I mean, this time, day and age, uh, COVID aside, this is something that uh, businesses should be should be doing anyway. Kira, is there any, do you have any specific examples of sort of things that were done locally that uh, that really helped businesses at all? Or, well, I think it was a lot of just um, necessity. You know, like the the first intake of this started pre-COVID, and the launch was a difficult time. It was right um, in late fall before the Christmas rush. And so a lot of businesses felt that the timing wasn't good. Um, but little did we know that in a few short months, we would all be kind of turning this way. And so a lot of businesses that up until this program hadn't thought about going online at all, or didn't really have anything other than maybe a presence, then went to um, an e-commerce option um, to be able to have commerce online. And so, um, and definitely there was some hesitancy that, you know, businesses didn't anticipate it would be an avenue that they would need to explore. But the, a lot of folks reported that the slowdown uh, being an entrepreneur and not being used to not having <laughs> being on the go kind of forced them to do things they hadn't anticipated and building websites and having e-commerce was was what folks got um, kind of got accomplished and luckily the the digital footprint allowed a little bit of um, folks who had been proactive and started doing the work even before the program had been announced, they did allow um, those folks to apply and get reimbursed for eligible expenses. So it was um, a nimble and responsive program that helped people um, with the challenges that they were facing. Rosemary? Yeah, and I just wanted to say that uh, a lot of the success was is due to Kira and to the facilitator, Jen Hudson, because um, on the BIA, I know there was a few people that really pushed back and initially, and then uh, once Jen got rolling with them, they were quite pleased and, and now very thankful that they did um, participate in the Digital Main Street and it's made a big difference with their businesses. So I, I, I think the personalities there were, were excellent to work with the public. So thank you, Kira, and also to Jen. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Doug, will you call a question, please? Councillor Kelleher McLennan. Yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Mayor Craig? Uh, yes. Chair <clears throat> seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a uh, uh, report. THF 2021-02, uh, the Fire Department Emergency Management Annual Report 2020. Be resolved that staff report THF 2021-02 from Tim Blake, Fire Chief, be the Fire Department uh, Emergency Management Annual Report be received for information. Can I get a mover and seconder, please? Moved by Rick. So second. Seconded by Gene. And um, any questions? Yes, Your Worship. Yes, Gene. In uh, relation to the report, I, I look at uh, Hall 1. They lead the way in ambulance calls, uh, vehicle calls, and alarms in a quite a disproportionate uh, 
ratio to the expect. Is that just uh, convenient that the eminence is situated in in Cavalford now, or and and the vehicle accidents by far forty four three and eight. Uh, just we got that many bad drivers in Cavalford. I know there is a lady or a person driving around a, a Pontiac, red Pontiac or yellow Pontiac with a, a slogan on the back that does identify that there are a lot of poor drivers in this small town. I won't quote the whole phrase, but it was quite funny. Uh, and the alarms as well. Uh, <laughs> are these alarms accidental alarms or are they burglary or uh, break and enter alarm events? I guess those, those are my questions. Other than that, it's quite an extensive report that takes some time to digest the whole thing. You, yeah. Mr. Mayor, uh, most of the questions there, Gene, are geographical. Uh, the uh, area covered by Station 1 is a greater geographical area. area and if you look at keeping that down, then they would be comparable. Uh, the roads through this area are, there's more major roads. You've got 30, 38. 8, 25, all, or 35, all through this Station 1 area. And that trend has been uh, steady since amalgamation and hasn't really changed a lot. You, that's around the 60% mark for Station 1, around in that area, usually uh, all through the whole area. Just more developed, but as you can see, Station 2 with the development going on there is a slight rise in calls there. It's the only one that went up this year. Okay. okay. We were drivers in Camelford, but I can't comment on that. <laughs> Anyone else? Michael? Thank you, Worship, and thanks, Tim. It was, a, it was a very detailed report. Gives us a lot of reading and information. Um, one of my questions is almost 40% of the annual calls are amb ambulance assist calls. For, uh, for our department. What type of assistance are these calls generally? I'm sure it may, it, it's a vast variety, but what, what type of things do the, uh, do the, does the crew do when they get these medical assist calls? Uh, we're, since, the amount, since we moved into the tiered response agreement back in 2015, I, uh, if you look at the data there in 2015, our calls dropped 86 calls in that time frame. And during, before 2015, we were going to anything from like get down to hangnails to stomach pains and that kind of stuff. With the agreement, we go to code four calls. So that's any life threatening call uh, or lift assist. So it has drastically reduced our call volume. And with uh, COVID starting last year, we also made some adjustments there, which have lowered our calls to only what we're needed on. Back before then, we go to a lot of calls, uh, uh, Mike, and they would be standing on the the step saying see you later it was a real waste of time so in most cases you can see there now by that data and i'm really glad that we started doing that back a long time ago it shows that we're really required now they're the not required are far less than they used to be so we actually are providing some type of service it could even get down to the other day we went to a call uh, we helped package the patient but they actually shoveled the step off the porch off in the driveway to the uh to the ambulance so that's the kind of things that we do on calls and uh and we're required more often and, and it makes the firefighters it's actually it was pretty tough before 2015 you can imagine getting up at two o'clock in the morning and going some guy uh standing on the porch more or less waving you off we're not required so it's actually helped a lot in that way so uh usually the average in ontario is about 50 percent for medical calls and that's pretty well standard. And we're trying to lower that down. It's not that we're not wanting to go, but we are wanting to go where we're required uh, to keep the vehicles off the road as much as possible for that kind of stuff. Thank you. Um, now uh, to talk about mutual aid, the mutual aid part of the report on January 24th, it says the Ontario Fire Marshal requested the aerial to attend the Crammy for an overhead picture. Do we receive any compensation from the Ontario Fire Marshal Office for that sort of service? No, it's uh, under the mutual aid agreement. We're not actually fighting a fire there. Yeah, no, it's uh, still a mutual aid for the count. Really, it's a request from through the fire marshal to Cranby Fire Department to go down, and they like the overhead as you 
seen in the news, it's a suspicious fire. So those type of shots are actually uh, uh, really good. And it actually is more just a mutual aid thing still with Crammy. Great. And on that point, what is the ratio of us going to assist in a mutual aid and getting receiving mutual aid? Actually, with you know, uh, it, include the automatic aid agreement. Of times we uh, yeah, versus we we're actually home. probably on the high side because we do have uh, better equipment uh, and we uh, can supply our own service, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, we usually, in most cases, it would be Brighton uh, is one of our calls that we use quite often. And then we have the luxury of Sterling, an outside partner. Uh, to the south and to the north sides, we have Havelock and uh, Asphodel El Norwood that we actually use. So Grammy, we actually have them in, they only cover that small portion of uh, Warkworth area in the backside. They're just south of Warkworth into that area. So in most cases, uh, we are the dominant mutual aid supplier in this area. Okay. And not to downplay the services that we have, but as we as a municipality, a small municipality, are investing more and more into our fire services, and we are providing more in the mutual aid thing uh, side of things, just is off. I, I, I understand that it's a necessity, it's the mutual aid, but as we are investing, it's sometimes for me challenging that we're sending a lot of the money that our communities have invested and we're not kind of getting the same back. I know that they would if they if they could, but that's just a, a point when I was reading through that I was um, interested in seeing. Um, can I have one more question, Your Worship? Yes. Uh, on page 44, um, in 2015, there was 625 incidents and 3,089 or sorry, 3,800 hours of personnel. And in 2020, there was 82 less incidents, so 543, but there's 2,594 more locked in hours at 6,491. Uh, uh, what would make the difference of less incidences, but a grossly amount of higher personnel hours? That's the calls I spoke to before. That's those calls where you get up at two o'clock in the morning, you drive to the scene and you're back home in 10 minutes. So there was 86 of them at that 10 minute mark. So they would they would put the calls uh, up in that area, but really the time wasn't there. So we got rid of all of them. I think it's over, our, I think it's over a hundred now that we've dropped in there. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's those the calls there, like just driving and going back home. So that's the kind of thing we're now, uh, we're getting major events where this year we've had Probably, I'd have to look at the data there. We've had less calls, but they've been major events. So they're three to four hours long. Or in 2015, that those calls with those short time, Amos calls really a lot of times only 30 minutes. And that's where you get those time going away up with the ratio. And 2015 actually saved us uh, a pile by doing that new tiered response agreement. And COVID in some ways is going to help us again. Yeah. And your mutual aid question, yes, you are correct, but uh, having them and knowing that they are available to us uh, before your time, Mike, they were here for our floods in 28, 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2017 uh, with crews with bells on. Uh, big crews come up here through those times. So uh, yeah, it might be a little different, but uh, if we have a flood here, uh, they are here and that's where our I like to supply that type of uh, uh, mutual aid. I'm glad to do it because when we get those floods, they're not fun. And uh, I know that each department within the county is here to help us out doing those. So that's kind of our payback. Okay. All in. Doug, would you call the question? Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship.
Thank you. <clears throat> We're at uh, report THF 2021-03, the fire department monthly report for January, 2021. Be resolved that staff report THF 2021-03 from Tim Blake, fire chief for the fire department monthly report for January, 2021 be received for information. And I can I get a mover and seconder for that, please. Moved by Rose, seconded by Kathy. Any questions on that one? Uh, Ken, and then uh, Kathy. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, a question here for Tim. I was just looking at the report and it says ambulance delay. Um, that can mean a number of things. So I just wondered what, uh, if Trent Hills was waiting for the ambulance to arrive or just what the situation was that it's labeled a delay. That's it. That's a use, Mr. Mayor. That's exactly what that is. If we are on scene prior to the ambulance, that is an ambulance delayed call. We are actually there. We are actually made contact with the patient prior to them getting on scene. Thank you. Okay, and Kathy. No, I I just wanted to to compliment the the department on the fantastic public relations that they got in the last month month and a half with their response to the two fires in Cramney uh, or in Colburn that uh, there's been a lot of publicity about what took place there. And I think the fact that, that we were noted as having responded and given tremendous assistance, especially in the fire this past week. Um, I, I know there are a lot of concerns about the uh, mutual aid, but it works both ways. And when we need them, they're there for us. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, the note of uh, with respect to the dry hydrant, and it may have been in the previous one as well, um, that we also received uh, support from the Rotary Club through a donation to the Fire and Emergency Fund, which is greatly appreciated. Um, and it's great for the community to note the fact that the firemen have not been able to do their, their fundraising for this, um, this uh, assistance and uh, came forward and uh, and supported those efforts. It's been difficult with COVID. And uh, I guess that the fire department's there to respond when needed. And um, it's it's been greatly appreciated by all communities. Thanks, Kathy. Anyone else? Would you call a question, please, Doug? Yes, Doug Kelleher McLennan. Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf. Yes. Councillor Redden. Yes. Councillor Tully. Yes. Councillor Bradley? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. We are at uh, report PWK 2021 02 through the annual reports for the Camelford Warkworth and Hastings drinking water systems. Be resolved the staff report PWK 2021 02 from Scott White. General Manager of Infrastructure Renewal and Public Works Administration, read the 2020 annual report for Camelford, Warkworth and Hastings drinking water system be received for information. And I get a mover and seconder for that, please. Moved by Rick. Seconded by Mike. Any discussion? Mike. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, quick question in the Campbellford filter media replacement. Is this the um, granular activated carbon that we need to replace on those? Sorry, Miss Scott here. Your Worship, um, Scott White has not joined the meeting. Yeah, he's, okay. he's away. Actually, he did state, though, if there were specific questions to track them, and he would uh, get back to everyone. Um, I do believe that is. I will double check the um, water wastewater budget because all of our capital items are listed there in terms of the amount. But I believe that is the requirement. Yeah. Okay. And I was just wondering how often those filters needed replaced, whether it was dependent on uh, the volume of filtered water. I can ask Scott sometime. That I won't be able to answer and I'm not going to try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah, Mike, uh, I'm sure that uh, you'll get uh, an answer from Scott on that. Anyone else? Rose, 
I had a question. Maybe I should just uh, talk to Scott as well. I was just curious, Lynn, if there's ever been any um, any further discussion on the lagoons and, and if um, the ministry seems to be okay with what we're doing and we seem to be uh, staying up to the standards, but I'm just looking at the future and the way some of our communities are being built, uh, more building coming in, et cetera. And I just wondered if there was ever any discussion lately around uh, the lagoon system and if they were indicating that we may have to look at um, a more progressive process. The wastewater lagoon in Workworth? Yeah. Uh, no, I've never um, had any, any feedback or discussion like that. The uh, annual compliance reports are there. Um, yeah, there's never any been, it's, it's, uh, there's lots of municipalities that use that system. And I don't think there's any capacity issues either, which could be an issue, um, currently anyway, in work yeah. So it seems to be working fine. Yeah. No, oh, good. That, that was my only concern was that with growth, should we be looking at the future and should we be looking at, um, what we might need to do, but if, as long as they're happy, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Rose, just to answer that question, I asked the very same thing of Scott. Uh, one, uh, I think it was last year. Anyway, uh, all kinds of capacity there uh, for it. Uh, it's very well taken care of. And Scott had nothing but great things to say about the lagoons, actually. And how uh, well he kind of wished we had two others instead of the, just in the one area. But uh, it, it was very complimentary about the lagoons, Rose. And uh, thanks for asking that. I know I did ask the same question. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Anyone else? Did you call a question, please, Doug? Councillor English? Yes. Yeah. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. We're at report PWK 2021-03, the 2020 annual wastewater system reports for Camelford, Workworth and Hastings. We resolved the staff report 2021-03 from Scott White, General Manager of Infrastructure, Renewal and Public Works Administration, read the 2020, 2020 annual wastewater system reports for Camelford, Workworth and Hastings, be received for information. Let me get a mover and seconder for that one, please. Moved by Ken, seconded by Kathy. Any discussion? Uh, Kathy and then Mike. Okay, j just, just a question. I'm not sure. I know it's in one of the wastewater reports. I'm just trying to pull it up. But it says that we have 100% uh, in both Hastings and uh, Warkworth of the uh, sewer and the wastewater um, um, systems and 85% diversion in Campbellford. Is there any plan to do anything about that additional 15% or is, or is it areas that are too unserviceable because of hills or whatever? Do you, do you know, Lynn, in, in our future, if we've got anything planned down the road? In terms of expanding the- uh, Yeah, more further separation. There isn't any current plan. I mean, obviously as development happens, that's something we, you know, build into the plan, yeah. but there isn't any sort of um, plans at this time to expand existing um, infrastructure to reach other areas within the community, no. Okay, I'm talking more about the separation, the sewer, oh, sewer and the storm separation. Is most of it hills and yes. areas that are unserviceable? Okay. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. Okay, uh, Mike, you had a question? Yeah, I think Scott walked out this time because I had five, but four of them are pretty technical. Um, one is uh, the raw sludge pumps. They, in, um, I believe it's Camphor facility, they're originally in 1960s and they're causing inconsistencies uh, at that facility. Is there a plan to replace these in the near future? Do we know if that's in, the, in a long-term plan at all? It would be in our capital. We have a 10 year capital plan as part of the water wastewater review. So it would be in there. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't have it right in front of me though, to give you the specifics. <laughs> so, yeah. And the others I will leave for Scott. Okay. 
Thanks, Mike. Uh, anyone else? Would you call a question, please, Doug? Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Ca uh, Mayor Craig? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. We're, oops, sorry. I just, uh, I'm not sure how I did that. Um, we're at report PWK 2021-04, uh, the 2020 MECP annual compliance report for the Hastings drinking water system. We resolved that staff report PWK-2021-04 from Scott White, General Manager of Infrastructure Renewal and Public Works Administration, read the 2020 MECP annual compliance report for the Hastings drinking water system be received for information. Could I get a mover and seconder for that? Kathy? I move. And G, uh, any questions on that one? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor. Yes. Uh, the report speaks of uh, two things. The algae bloom issue at that one time, but one more that I'm interested in is the backflow policy that they think we should introduce. From my personal experience, working in a insurance adjuster in the water floods they had in Peterborough for two years there, I still got vivid and vivid uh, memories of seeing a, a young lad in a dinghy boat in the living room in about two feet of sludge that had come in into a house close to the Kinsman arenas in, Haste, in uh, Peterborough on Concello. And that was all a result of the pressure in the system that come up through and it backfilled up through the toilet and through showers, just like geysers. And it's nothing to be uh, put off, I don't think. And we've had those heavy rains of talk of 100 year rains. Well, Peterborough had two of them and uh, there's nothing to say that we won't have them again here. Uh, is there anything in the long range plans to develop a policy toward having these back, back, uh, backflow valves put into especially new homes that are being built and carry on with the older ones that, to, as well? Lynn? I can speak to that too, Mr. Mayor. Um, there is, um, the county has um, taken the approach because <sighs> There aren't any municipalities, I don't believe in Northumberland County um, that do have a backflow prevention program. Um, there has been a draft bylaw created. Um, I'm not sure where that is, to be honest. There are a lot of challenges in implementing something like this and it would only impact commercial properties. It was all, would all be about um, the, reducing the risk of contaminating the drinking water system. It's not so much about helping residences. It's more about protecting the drinking water system from large with large manufacturers, that sort of thing. So what it would mean is if, um, if it, well, when I shouldn't say if, when this ends up being implemented in Trent Hills is that it would be a significant cost to all businesses because they would be required to install a backflow uh, prevention measures. Um, so it is coming. Uh, it is something that, you know, all municipalities are talking about. And um, the hope was that it would sort of be rolled out uh, consistently across the county, but it, it will be something that will have to come before council. It's been discussed a number of times, but it will be a significant cost to businesses and potentially to the municipality. So we've also um, been told that we are, um, I mean, it's never been an issue here ever. Um, so it's, it is a fairly low risk, but at some point it's going to become legislation. So that is a standard recommendation that's in all compliance reports now, if you don't have a backflow prevention, um, essentially we've been put on notice that it's, we're not gonna have a choice uh, one of these days. So there, there, it is in the works to answer your question. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Would you call the question please, Doug? Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher-McLennan? Yes. 
uh, Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Mayor Craig? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, report PWK 2021-05, the 2020 uh, MECP Annual Compliance Report for the Work with Drinking Water System. Be resolved that staff report PWK 2021-05 from Scott White, General Manager of Infrastructure Renewal and Public Works Administration, read the 2020 MECP Annual Compliance Report for the Work with Drinking Water System. Be received for information. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Rick, seconded by Ken. Uh, any any uh, questions on that one? Would you call a question, please, Doug? Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Craig? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Yeah. Thank you. We're at report PWK 2021-06, the 2020 fourth quarter operational report for water and wastewater. Be resolved in staff report PWK 2021-06 from Scott White, General Manager of Infrastructure Renewal and Public Works Administration. Read the 2020 fourth quarter uh, department uh, fourth quarter operational report for the water wastewater be received for information. Can I move her in a seconder for that one, please? Moved by Mike, second by Rose. Any questions? Call a question, please, Doug. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Mayor Craig? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Re report PWK 2021-07, the 2020 summary reports for the Calumford Warkworth and Hastings Drinking Water Systems. Uh, be, be it resolved that staff report PWK 2021-07 from Scott White General Manager of Infrastructure Renewal and Public Works Administration, read the 2020 summary reports for the Camelford Warkworth and Hastings Drinking Water Systems be received for information. Can I get a mover and seconder, please? Moved by Ken. No second. Seconded by Gene. Any questions on that one? Would you call a question, please, Doug? Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, we are at report planning 2021 07, severance consent application B01 2021. Be resolved that staff report planning 2021 07 from Liz Stillman. Planning Coordinator, read the severance consent application B01-2021, concession to part of lot 25, County Road 8, former township of Seymour, Jim and Mary Thompson be received for information. And that severance consent application B01-2021 to create an easement on parts one, two, and three on plan 39R uh, 14098 for the uh, adjacent property owners uh, be approved with the conditions as set forth in the report. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? No, by, no, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by Kathy. Uh, any questions on that one? Your Worship, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the mover. Oh, uh, Rosemary moved and uh, Kathy seconded. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, call the vote, please. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Councillor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yeah, yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Mayor Craig? Yes. 
Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, report planning 2021-08, consent application B02-2021. Be resolved that staff report planning 2021-08 from Liz Stillman, planning coordinator, read the severance consent application B02-2021 at 423 Concession Road 2 East, uh, Concession Road Oh, Concession Road 2 East for Trevor Moon be received for information and that severance consent application B02-2021 to create two separate parcels which have merged in title and is approved with the uh, conditions as set forth in the report. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Ken, seconded by Rick. Any discussion on that one? You call a question, please, Doug. Councillor Tully. Yes. Councillor Bratney. Yes. Councillor English. Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan. Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf. Yes. Councillor Redden. Yes. Mayor Cray. Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. We are at planning report 2021-09. Severance consent application B03-2021 and zoning amendment application C01-2021. Uh, there's two motions to this report. So the first one being be resolved that staff report planning 2021-09 from Liz Stillman, planning coordinator, re severance can ap consent application B03-2021 and zoning amendment application C01-2021 Concession 10, part of lots 11 and 12, uh, 11707, County Road 45, Beamish Road, former Township of Percy, uh, Heather Hodder and James Dyer be received for information and that cons severance con consent application B03-2021 to sever one new parcel being approximately 1.03 acres of vacant land from approximately 15.98 acres for residential building purposes be approved with the conditions as set forth in the report. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Kathy. Seconded by Mike, any discussion? Mike? Mayor. Mike and then Gene. Thank you, Worship. When um, we were talking about this application, there was some concern from the Lower Trent Conservation. Has those concerns be, been addressed? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I can address that. Yep. Uh, yes, uh, we've had a uh, preliminary survey done showing that the uh, current location of the lot is outside the 120 meter buffer. So um, that's been dealt with uh, adequately. Thank you. And uh, Gene? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, I spoke to this before about these small lots. And in the minutes that we passed today, we had the very situation I'm speaking of. People in that resolution, we added some land to a, a property that was very tiny and they wanted to build a, a note building of some kind, the same situation could apply to this one. If they wanted to have any other buildings built on this property, they'd be very confined to work around the, the septic and the, the well. And I just still have that concern that in the future, those small lots are gonna come back to bite people. Not that it's gonna bother council, but it's gonna bother the property owners that, they're constricted to what they might want to do with the property, but that's my comments. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I can address that if you wish. Um, so this is a unique situation. It's a family situation. They've asked for a smaller lot than normally. Our, our requirement is normally two acres. They've asked for one. We've had submissions from their septic installer to indicate the soils can support um, the septic system on a smaller lot, and they are proposing a smaller home. So they're they're aware of the situation and it's uh, it's unique, it's not usual. And 
um, the um, zoning will acknowledge that reduced lot size. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? You call a question, please, Doug. Councillor Redden. Yes. Councillor Kelly. Yes. Councillor Bratney. Yes. Councillor English. Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan. Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf. Yes. Mayor Crate. Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, the second part of that uh, would be uh, be it resolved that zoning amendment application C01-2021 to rezone the severed portion from severance consent application B03-2021 to rural residential exception environmental protection and environmentally sensitive be approved. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Rick, seconded by Ken. Any discussion on that? Would you call the question, please, Doug? Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Uh, yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, uh, we are now at planning 2021-10 minor variance application A01-2021. Uh, be resolved that staff report planning 2021-10 from Liz Stillman, planning coordinator, re minor variance application A01-2021 at 30 Bridge Street South, John Walsh, be received for information and that minor variance application A01-2021 to permit a sign on the subject property which does not meet the required setback from the road or adjacent lot line and is greater than the maximum area of a sign permitted within a residential zone be approved. Get a mover and seconder for that. Moved by Rick. Seconded by Mike. Any discussion? Would you call a question, please, Doug? Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Uh, we're at planning report 2021-11. Declaration of Sale of Surplus Lands. We resolved that staff report planning 2021-11 from Liz Stillman, planning coordinator, re Declaration of Sale of Surplus Lands, Queen Street West, Plan 51, Block K, Lot 12, former Village of Hastings, Habitat for Humanity of Northumberland be received for information and that the lands described as Plan 51, Block K, Lot 12, Queen Street West, former Village of Hastings, Plan or PIN number 51215-0165-1.7, uh, be declared surplus for the needs of the municipality and then sold to the Habitat for Humanity of Northumberland pursuant to motion numbers THC-2008-18 and THC dash 2011095 in accordance with bylaw number 2004-38 being a bylaw to establish procedures for the sale of land surplus to the municipality of Trent Hills that the mayor and clerk execute the required transfer deed of land as well as any documents that may be necessary to affect the sale of surplus lands and that the appropriate bylaw be brought forward for council's consideration. Could I get a mover and second for that, please? Those seconded by Mike. Any discussion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, quick question to Jim. I saw in the correspondence somebody called uh, over the office, sound like, and 
said they never got a reply back and it did say their concern about it. Has that been addressed, Jim, yet? Uh, through you, Your Worship, yes, it has. Um, we've um, been in correspondence with the owner to the north, the owner to the east, and the owner across the road. So, and we'll continue to keep them informed. Um, and we're relaying the same um, information to Habitat for Humanity. They're very interested in working with all the neighbors and making sure all the concerns are addressed. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Thank you, Your Worship. I had jump to a question about the bylaw uh, and it in and it states a uh, sale price of twenty two thousand one hundred and fifteen dollars. Can we what's our approximate cost to date that we've put into getting to the point where we are to declare this a surplus? And what again was our estimated development charges on on the, the property? Um, to you, your worship. Um, so the main part of the price was at the direction of council. The expenses that we've undertaken uh, for legal work are the $2,115, and the development charges will be in the range of twenty-five dollars to $27,000. Thank you. Anyone else? Would you call a question, please, Doug? Yes, sir, Kelleher McClendon? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. I report CAO 2021 uh, 03, Vacant Land Ac Acquisition from Transport Canada. Be resolved that staff report CAO 2021 03 from Lynn Phillips, Chief Administrative Officer, re vacant land acquisition from Transport Canada, be received for information. And that the purchase of the land located on Concession 11, Lot 25 on Kings <coughs> Grand Road from Transport Canada be funded from the tax proceeds reserve. That the amount drawn from the tax proceeds reserve to purchase the property be repaid to the reserve in the event that the municipality should sell the land in the future and that the chief administrative officer execute the required documents to complete the purchase of the land. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? So moved. Moved by Jean, seconded by Kathy. Uh, any questions on that one? Michael? Thank you, Your Worship. Just sort of the history of this, this land with the tower being there, it, it jogged my thought process. Um, and perhaps uh, you, Mayor, would have have an idea. Is, what is, is, what's Eorn, where is it they standing as far as um, internet networks or are they solely on uh, cell networks? No, they, they um, both uh, Eorn and, and um, uh, there's actually, uh, uh, right now there's an RFP out um, regarding uh, broadband and um, there will be towers involved, um, especially in uh, uh, more remote areas. And um, my thought I think would be similar to yours that um, having the opportunity to, to have this available uh, might be very fortuitous in the future because uh, uh, in order to, uh, they're not going to be able to get everybody um, through uh, putting in um, fiber optics. So some of it's going to be towers. And uh, I, I think um, uh, on either level, whether it's Eorn or um, the, you know, the county is looking at uh, putting in a, a, a bid right now. So, uh, it, one or the other, um, I think for in the future, we might be uh, looking at the use of this again. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. So the RFP is, is a county RFP out or is that through? There's two, the, the, the ERN has one, but there, there, there's been some, a um, uh, couple, you know, a couple of instances where they, they put out um, 
a general RFP and, and the county has, has actually answered one RFP or, or is in the midst of putting in a, a, a bid. So, um, and that's as, uh, as far as it goes right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Could you call a question please, Doug? Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, we have a COVID-19 municipal service update. Be be it resolved that the verbal information presented by Lynn Phillips, the Chief Administrative Officer for COVID-19 for municipal service update be received, but first we'd like her to give it to us. Happy to. Um, just uh, as you probably have all heard on Friday, um, the province did announce that our particular health team was returning to the framework. Uh, we have been placed in the orange category, uh, which is restrict. Um, so it's similar to uh, where we were prior to Christmas, although we think we started off in yellow. So it's a bit higher than that in terms of restrictions. Um, I don't really see any major changes to municipal operations. Um, at this point, we have our staff scheduling done for the municipal office. I am recommending we just leave things as they are status quo, uh, maybe for and revisit things on a two week basis. Um, over the weekend, I heard lots about you know, a third wave coming. And I don't, I don't quite know where all this is going. And um, in terms of, you know, stability of service and staffing, uh, I am recommending that we leave the office as it is. We are serving people remotely through online, by phone, et cetera, and revisit things again, as I said, in two weeks. Where it does have an impact is through our recreation centers because we are now able to open again with restrictions put in place. Um, I see Peter is on the line. I don't know if he could come on and um, maybe speak to that more. We do have the opportunity to open both arenas. Obviously it's not a light switch. We do need a bit of time to get staffing and everything else in place. Um, but our staff have been in touch with our user groups. And um, as I said, Peter can give an update as to where we are there. For you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I actually just got a text right this second. Um, one of our user groups has canceled the season. <clears throat> So where we are now, we are, we are prepared to reopen the arenas um, to the same level as we were uh, pre-Christmas when we were, uh, went into the lockdown. The, uh, that meaning, you know, restricted access into the building um, uh, and restricted number of people in the building and so on. The, the user groups uh, are well aware of those requirements because that's where we were. Um, when we opened and we kept that same level of service the whole time. So um, staff right now are, are reaching out to the user groups to just kind of concrete when they would like to get back into the buildings. Um, we, we do need to be, uh, you know, very cautious when we, we open up again. So we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're opening for a rental and not just opening to have the building open. Uh, we do need time to mobilize things. As Lynn said, this announcement came through um, on Friday and uh, you know our part-time staff have been laid off. So uh, we've made contact with them and are just waiting to hear back their availability to come back to work. Um, our full-time staff uh, have been, we, we, we put out two schedules. We are restricted by the collective agreement of when we can change their scheduling. So, uh, you know, we're working within those constraints. So um, it looks like the Campbellford Rebels ha have pulled the plug for the season. That just came through here um, just moments ago. Uh, so we're waiting to hear back from uh, Campbellford Minor Hockey and work with Minor Hockey and a few other uh, smaller groups um, to see when they would like to get back in the building for sure. And uh, then we can kind of work backwards a little bit and make sure that we're prepared to be open um, to that level. The, we did take advantage of this uh, shutdown in Workworth to do some uh, um, maintenance repairs and upgrades to the boards. So um, we just have to tidy up that work uh, in order to get the, the facility ready for the public. Um, so I don't have a date when we could open at this point. Uh, I would 
presume it would be this week. That's what we're aiming for, whether it's, uh, you know, Friday or Saturday, we'll have to see when the user groups are available and when we can, um, you know, make sure that uh, uh, the buildings are, are ready for everybody. The, uh, the field house is another matter. We're kind of back to where we were, um, you know, when we first decided we were going to open. A lot depends on what staffing we can uh, put in place so that we can have adequate coverage for that facility. So um, our plan is that we, we look at opening the two arenas, get those staffing levels uh, concrete and stable, and then we can look at opening the, uh, the field house um, on a Monday to Friday basis, the way we, we did just pre-shutdown, and then uh, look at reopening uh, further depending on on the lockdown situation or, or the COVID uh, situation. So um, that's our plan. And uh, we're just in a wait and see right now to get confirmation from the user groups, as I said. So if there's any questions, I'd gladly answer them. Thanks, Peter. Any questions for Peter? Michael? Thank you, Worship. Yeah, it's just to do with the, the field house, <clears throat> what's, you said it's Monday to Friday. What, what were the hours that you're looking at? I can't remember from before. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, what we did, and it's strictly because of a staffing, uh, well, not strictly, but um, we were doing a soft opening at the field house, if you remember, uh, which was just to get people in the building and get the programs up and running. Um, and we have one full-time staff that works there Monday to Friday. Uh, 8 30 to 4 30 um, and we didn't have the staff available to work uh, on weekends because we need two to three staff in that building due to the requirements of covid so uh, taking advantage of that one staff that is scheduled as per the collective agreement monday to friday 8 30 to 4 30 uh, we, we only need one additional staff or sometimes two additional staff depending um, instead of three uh, if we were opening on a weekend so um or in the evening. So that's why uh, we were opening essentially nine o'clock to four o'clock, giving the staff opportunity to open the building and then close the building. Um, and it was busy. We were, we were pretty steady all day, every day uh, that we were open. And, you know, we were looking at the, op at the, the option or the opportunity to open um, longer and on weekends. And then we got locked down again. So the field house is a little bit more uh, well, it's quite a bit more challenging to operate than an arena uh, just because of the flow of traffic and it's not a single use facility. So there's walking, working out, there's field uh, play with golf, there's racket court sports going on all at the same time. Um, so there, it is logistically a lot more difficult and we have to do, we as in staff have to do all of the contact tracing requirements where in the arenas that's handled by the user group. So it's, there's a significant more, a significantly more um, involved in, in running the field house than it is the arena. So looking in the next little bit, if, if our um, arena user groups are not coming to the table and they're canceling seasons, is there an ability to uh, adjust some of the staffing to be able to um, take benefit of the use of the field house for longer hours and, and weekends for for those that are currently working or a family that might be able to only use it at times. I'm just not sure where, what's the feasibility of it? Yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, that is, that's a possibility. Uh, right now, uh, you know, from communications that staff have had with work with minor hockey, they are planning on coming back. Um, so that all that has to be solidified. So we only have one main user group in work with, for an example. So, you know, if, if there is not enough ice time there um, or, or no, no commitment from user groups, then that's a consideration to, to reallocate staff to another facility. The one challenge is to make sure that we can do it on a consistent basis for scheduling, right? So it's not like if, you know, the arena is closed on a Tuesday because there's no rentals that we open up the field house for a Tuesday. Um, we have to do it consistently. So, um, Right now, there's we have to just see what part-time staff are available to come back and when, and what the user groups are uh, prepared to commit to us um, concretely, and then we can make the decision on on what we're going to open 
and, uh, and at, at what level we're going to open. So the, right now the arenas are, uh, you know, we want to try to get those open if, if at all possible. And, um, you know, if the hours are there, um, you know, from a staffing perspective, there's no, nothing saying that we couldn't open an pardon me, the field house consistently though, on one night a week or something like that, depending on what staff we have available. So this, the, the COVID requirements really take a toll on our staffing. So, um, you know, we have to be very mindful of, uh, of the numbers that are required to run the, build, the buildings the way we need to. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Okay, Rick. No, I'm good, Bob. You're good? Okay. Everyone else okay? So I read the resolution already. Um, do I have a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Rick. Seconded by Ken. Can you call a question, please, Doug? Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, we're now at reports of members of council. So we will start um, with Michael Metcalf, immediately to my right. Thank you, Your Worship. A uh, few things were going on. Uh, the Mayor's Traffic and Calming traffic calming task force met January 20th, 20th. We had some good discussions between um, uh, staff, OBP, uh, on, on some things that we can, we can look at and, and uh, look into to see how we can tackle our, our traffic uh, issues. And I guess they're really not our, only our issues, they're issues everywhere. So I don't think we should, should uh, take credits for having the only traffic issues uh, in our municipality. Um, also attended the Autonomy Region Conservation Authority Annual General Meeting where uh, David Crombie spoke and provided his opinion on the outlook uh, on the relationship between the province and the conservation authorities. And it was a, an interesting take on, on his thoughts uh, and experiences on, on that topic. Um, and I also attended the County Council uh, virtual meeting on January 27th. Thank you. Richard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nothing much to report. I did attend a virtual Eastern Ontario Trails Alliance committee meeting last Thursday and also attended the uh, AGM for Lower Trent last Thursday as well. It was virtual for some and live for others because of the dif different health districts. Uh, out of that, the new chairman is Eric Sanford uh, from Center Hastings for Lower Trent, and the vice chair is Mary Tadman from the municipality of Brighton. And that's all I have to report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Rose? Um, I have nothing new to report at this time. I've been lazy. My heavens. Uh, Councillor Brahini. Yes, uh, similar to my cohort, I attended the uh, Lord Trent meeting and I did uh, view the autonomy annual meeting as well with David Crombie. I found him very interesting and he didn't beat around the bush about what his thoughts were about the government stand on conservations. Uh, just a couple of comments about the Roma conference that I viewed. Uh, the Attorney General, obviously he's picked up the, uh, the talking points of Ralph Goodell on the issue of uh, joint and several. And just like Ralph, he told us many, many, many times, going to get right onto that and solve that. <laughs> and now I see Ralph has moved on to solving the issues of a plane crash. Uh, uh, he, just, he just doesn't seem to go away. But Similarly, the Attorney General of Ontario, he's going to get right on and solve this joint and several. And I think that's a major, major issue that's out there that's going to bite us. And we're seeing now where some of the insurance premiums are doubling and tripling from what they had been. Uh, and that's the reason of it. 
that is the very reason of it. And I don't know what government is going to come ahead and, and take a hold of it and bite it and, and bring some common sense to it because it just, it just can't go on. Other than that, uh, it's been a cold, cold, blustery day today in Trent Hills and uh, lots of snow to blow here yet. So that's what we're doing. Thanks, Gene. Ken. Uh, like uh, Councilor Rosemary, I have no committee meetings uh, so far this month, so all is quiet. Thank you very much. And Catherine. Thank you. Um, I'll take all their time. How's that? Um, I do have some things to report. Uh, first of all, I did attend the virtual Roma convention, and I really enjoyed the opening comments by Chantelle Hebert. Uh, she has an interesting take, and if you're a fan of hers, she always comes out with something that makes you think. Um, but I was most pleased, one of the reasons I tuned in to hear the ministers was uh, Minister Hardiman. And as Jean may already know, he made a really big announcement about special funding for Ontario Fairs, which will benefit the two egg societies in our community. And um, many of them are already considering um, what they're going to be doing this year, if it's at all possible to plan. And uh, so that funding is, is, going to, um, is going to help them. Um, I also sat in on their, the, the local Campbellford Seymour Egg Society's um, AGM and was incredibly impressed by their ambassador and the speech that she gave, um, Haley Curl Palmer. She, is, she had such a wonderful um, uh, speech. Um, she will be attending the um, Ontario Fairs con Convention, which is happening this week. Um, and um, I, I haven't heard as good a take from um, somebody, I guess you could say under 30 for a long time about living in rural areas, the importance of community and so on and so forth. Um, she's a real contender for ambassador of the fairs for Ontario. And um, she's also looking, working in one of our local um, law, legal offices and um, a very bright light. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the local ag society has their fingers crossed that, that she will do well. Um, also, it's Heritage Week this week. I think that staff have put a number of things on the um, Facebook page. And um, I just want to make recognition of our, um, of our um, members of the Heritage Advisory Committee. Jackson Thurling, Sky Morrison, Kat Kinch, Judy Pierce, and Eric Buss. And they are a fabulous group to be working with. Um, they've always got some very challenging ideas coming forward. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of those groups where you're pulling on the reins rather than dragging them forward. Um, and I just think that we're, we're very blessed to have a group like that that are willing to step forward. Um, I also attended the Crow Valley AGM and uh, uh, I don't know whether I'm happy or not happy at this point. Um, I was re-elected as chair of the Crow Valley. Um, I had said it would be my last, my last term uh, or last year. However, given the circumstances of COVID, my availability to sign checks and a few other things, I agreed to stay on. But I have been given an, an, excellent, uh, an excellent executive to work with. Um, the one thing I do want to note, and I'm sure it did come up at your other AGMs for those of you on authorities, is the working group that's been appointed to deal with Bill 229 and some of the recommendations coming out about authorities. We are drafting a letter. The Crow is actually um, covered by four different MPPs and we're drafting a letter to send to them, which as well will come out to the various municipalities for support. In looking at the appointment of the committee, there are no small rural authorities represented. And we're concerned that our voice and some of our concerns won't be heard. So we're taking the initiative to address it to our MPPs and perhaps we'll have further conversation with them. Um, and the final note that I'd like to make, and uh, I imagine Councillor Kelleher McLennan will like to chime in on this one as well, is that we want to recognize the recent retirement of the Trent Hills Library CEO, Mary Jo Mahoney. Um, she had a 24 year association with our library and held a number of positions, most recently since 2015, acting as its CEO. And I believe that formal recognition by the council and the mayor would be in order as she moves on to new stages and new challenges in her life. 
Um, she's contributed a great deal. Uh, one of the things most notably was her past experience working with the children's library and the story hours and the number of kids that have grown up having her as their librarian in that area. So I just like to see your worship. I know we've already, already communicated. I think a formal recognition um, of her retirement should go out. Unfortunately, it's not a time when uh, we can, you know, in the past they've had teas, they've had receptions open houses, um, it isn't gonna happen because of our circumstances, but I think something from the municipality is in order. And there is a search committee now formed uh, that is um, in the initial stages of uh, looking for her replacement. And uh, no word on that is yet, they're just in the early stages. So uh, Councillor McLennan uh, may have something to add to this as well, because uh, she is a good friend of the former CEO. Thanks, Kathy. No, I think you summed it up. I, I think uh, you uh, covered all the points and uh, I guess uh, that she's at that point. We're uh, moving on to retirement and uh, looking at what's ahead. Uh, but um, thanks for your thanks for your input. So your worship, I, I don't know if, if I if I should move a, a motion of uh, congratulations and thanks or whether just the direction of the head nods of this group is, is to draft some form of a, of a letter on our behalf. I'll leave yeah, it to you. I, oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. And I, I appreciate your uh, taking the lead on that. Uh, I, I don't think we need a motion. Um, um, I, I think all council agrees that, uh, um, you know, we, we should acknowledge the, 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 um, gr the great work and the long tenure. Um, and uh, so I, I will take it upon myself to uh, get something uh, drafted and I will um, I will get it off to her it's, it's it, again uh, you know um, sad that that we we can't do some type of formal recognition where we can all get together but uh, you know if we keep keep track of all these things maybe we can have one giant get together when this is all over <laughs> and, uh, we, can get, we can get everybody we'll take over the uh, field house or an arena someplace and get everybody in the in the same place to say thank you but I, I will look after that and thank you very much Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. And I, I, I don't have a lot. I, I, I did have, uh, um, you know, we did have our, as Mike said, our first traffic calming meeting, which I, I thought went very well. And, um, you know, there was a number of ideas came up and, and there's some came up since. And uh, I know we are looking at different areas of, uh, of cost and, and, uh, and what's effective. And, and so we're, we're working on that. Um, yeah, I, I attended Roma also uh, virtually, and um, uh, there were some very good, um, very good uh, talks. I, I thought Mr. Hardiman did a great job um, on his. Um, uh, to Gene's point of joint and several liability, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm in, involved in that right now at the county because of uh, our problems with uh, snowmobiling in the in the forest, um, uh, and it all comes down to exactly that joint and several liability. Um, we have to have protection and, and, and insurance is, uh, is the root of the whole situation. So, um, and I, I, have, I have brought my concerns on joint and several liability to, uh, to uh, our MPP, David Pacini, and uh, you know, David has, has taken those forward um, to the government. So um, it's, it's a work in progress, although I, uh, I, I don't see a resolution because I, I think what would happen is if, if uh, we get left off the hook on joint and several, it goes to the province. And uh, I don't think they're gonna <clears throat> you know, look on that favorably. Um, the one thing I would ask is, is that we all, uh, especially now we're going into this new orange um, uh, designation for COVID that, that we reiterate to everybody that, you know, stay the course and obey the rules. Uh, you know, um, even, you know, as far as masks and washing hands and all the rest of those things, do them more frequently if, it's, if, if you can, just because um, the more that, that we are cautious here, um, the sooner that we will get back to normal. And it, it looks like um, um, inoculations of the vaccine um, hopefully will be coming out. Uh, we've done all the nursing homes uh, and, and seniors residents have been done in, in, uh, in the area. And um, so that's a start, but uh, we need to get in and do a lot more arms. And I, 
I hope that, you know, the numbers that are being talked about um, come to fruition. If they do by, uh, you know, by the end of March uh, and into April, um, we should all be looking at the opportunity to, uh, to get a shot. And, um, uh, and if that happens, um, I, I think we can look forward to a, um, you know, a, a much better summer this year than we had last year. Um, and so <clears throat> there go with the, the uh, words from the Mount for today. Um, and I, I thank you all for all, all you're doing. It, it's, it's, um, I know, I know we're not having, um, uh, we're not having a lot of in-person meetings, but I, uh, I know everybody's involved in talking to people and, and we just, uh, you know, keep to the resolve. That would be great. Okay, so we're now at the consent agenda and um, <clears throat> we have minutes of the Eastern Ontario Trails Alliance meeting held on December the 10th, 2020. Minutes of the BIA board meeting held on December the 14th, 2020. The Crow Valley Conservation Authority Municipal Brief from January 2021 and the Auto Autonomy Conservation Your Watershed News from February of 2021. We resolved that staff recommendations with respect to the consent agenda items 10A to 10D be adopted as printed. And could I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Mike, seconded by Rose. Uh, anyone have any questions on any of those uh, uh, things? Okay, Ken. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wondered in the Crow, uh, depending where we are with vaccinations and different colored zones, again, there's the Crow got an action plan if we have a repeat of the problems with the uh, overabundance of enthusiastic visitors that happened last year? Um, uh, Lynn can answer that. We had discussions last week. Go ahead, Lynn. Um, to me, Mr. Mayor, well, it would be the municipality's action plan, not, not the Crows, if, if we go down that road. Uh, we are currently awaiting um, official requests from the Crow. I know it was supposed to be discussed at the February board meeting. Uh, perhaps Councillor Redden has more information on that. I'm not sure when the February board meeting is. When that comes forward, um, if the Crow does in fact wish to renew the operating agreement with the municipality, uh, we will come to Council with some um, plans to address your concerns. Um, to try and control things a little bit better there. Um, so staff are sort of working in the background. We've got some you know, ideas and costs and estimates and that sort of thing. Um, but again, a lot, of, a lot of things are up in the air at this point. Um, who knows if we'll even be able to open it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a bit early this year, but we are um, going to be ready um, if we are able to open it this year. So uh, more to come on that, but step one is to um, hear from the Crow and to look at renewing that agreement. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, our, our meeting is next week. Uh, so I'm assuming it will be on the agenda. I haven't spoken to the uh, general manager this week, but we've had a uh, number of pieces of correspondence that I have forwarded on, have come to me directly and then forwarded on to, uh, to Tim Piddick as well as to Lynn. Um, some a, a fair amount coming from those who are living across the the river from from the park or have um, been part of um, efforts in the past to help with with it and I, I know that it's uh, it's a, a really big issue. Um, we certainly have the same thing with the gut Callahan Rapids uh, the other the other areas um, those people that had good experiences made sure everybody knew about it. So we're looking at probably having a whole new group of people that have never discovered us before. Although I was pleased to see that Canada's Wonderland wants to open in May and that may siphon off a few of them, but, but it is an issue. I really think we will want to go ahead with that partnership. I, I think it's a win-win a for all of us, particularly the Crow Authority. Um, we don't have the, the ability to to monitor it, man it, person it, and, and fund it as, as a municipality does. So I think we're hoping for that partnership, but um, it's going to be a challenge and, and a challenge I think that we're going to have to put on our books for all of our areas, whether it's the Crow, whether it's our, our bridge, the suspension bridge, any of those areas um, are going to see a huge number of visitors and um, new challenges coming in all those areas. So it's next week. We'll talk about it. Lynn, I may speak to you as well. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. 
Thanks, Ken and Kathy. Uh, yeah, Rose. Uh, just a quick question for Councillor Redden. Um, has there been any talk of um, having a, a fee at the gate, having someone, uh, potentially a student or somebody there that would be taking a fee to enter like we used to do years ago? Yes. Um, I think the, there, there has been fairly wide support. Lynn, Lynn can address this too because she's had more discussion perhaps. But I think there's been reasonably good support from the local um, uh, community around these, these areas. And, and we'll talk particularly about the Crow um, for some kind of, of, uh, of fee to get in. Most of these individuals are used to handing over $10, $15 an individual to get into some of the places in, in the GTA um, and, and the areas they come from. So I think some of them are quite pleased not to have to give us anything when they're used to. Um, the problem is probably going to be, as Lynn will tell you, how we get that infrastructure in place, whether it's an arm or a gate or people or how we train them. All of that presents a fair upfront cost. I'll, turn it over to Lynn for that, but but it's on the books. It's just, how do we make it happen? Lynn, yeah, this is very true. Um, again, that's part of the plan we'll bring forward to council if and when the agreement's entered into. Uh, if, if, if it's able to open this year, if, if, um, you know, there is gonna be a significant cost. So there'll have to be some cost recovery. And um, that's one of the ways, obviously, that we'd be looking at recovering that cost would be to charge an entrance into the park. So. That will be council's decision though. Um, if we're operating the park, it will be up to council to decide, not the Crow, um, how, how that will look. So that will be, that will all be presented to you for um, consideration at some point soon. Right, and, and I, just, I just think um, if any of us do get contacted by the community around Crow Bridge, um, we would love to have a meeting. Um, I know almost two years ago we were prepared and then got way late on that. Um, it isn't that we don't want their input, it's just the difficulties of, of making it work. And um, as Lynn said, it, it's up to council basically how it goes. And, um, and so um, as long as we keep those lines of communication open, um, we'll do our best uh, to, to make something suitable for this season till we're out of the situation we're in and then go forward. It's it's like juggling. Okay, Michael. Thank you, Worship. And like uh, like uh, Councillor <clears throat> Councillor Redden said, there's a lot of challenges with with these outdoor recreation type things. But I also see it as great um, and and potentially successful opportunities that that we can take as a municipality and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what reports and what we can come forward and and seeing how we can handle these uh, facilities and and make them more of an opportunity for the municipality thank you anyone else Doug I, I turned the page over here so are we uh, have we You've read the motion. We haven't called the vote yet. Oh, okay. Thank you. Call the vote, please. Deputy Mayor Metcalf. Yes. Councillor Redden. Yes. Councillor Tully. Yes. Councillor Bratney. Yes. Councillor English. Yes. Councillor Kelleher McLennan. Yes. Mayor Crate. Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. We're at bylaws. Be it resolved that bylaw number 2021-012, bylaw number 2021-013, bylaw number 2021-014, uh, bylaw number 2021-015, bylaw number 2021-016, be read a first, second, and third time passed and properly signed and sealed by the clerk and mayor. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? So moved. Moved by Gene, second by Ken. Any discussion on any of those? Call a question, please, Doug. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher-McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. 
Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, we have no notice of motions. We have uh, nothing for a closed session. Uh, the confirmation bylaw be resolved that bylaw number 2021-017, a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meeting held on Tuesday, February the 16th, 2021, be read a first, second, and third time, passed properly, signed and sealed by the clerk and mayor. And I get a mover and seconder, please. So moved. I missed that. Uh, Ken and uh, Kathy, uh, any discussion? Call the vote, please, Doug. Councillor Tully? Yeah, yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Councillor Kelleher McClendon? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by seven, Your Worship. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Rose. Nobody else. Seconded by Rick. Call the question, please, Doug. Councillor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Deputy Mayor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Councillor English? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. We are adjourned at 1137, Your Worship. I'll just stop the.